Hi, good good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome again to uh, our monthly uh, webinar, a part of our uh, series of webinars that we've been running now for uh, probably seems like a couple of years, um, where before Zoom was a real thing, and now we all know how to use it, so that's great. So uh, good evening and welcome, and thanks for joining us. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm hosting the event. I'm the current national chairman of the TFA, um, and I'll do my best to chair as best I can. Um, as, as usual, we are extremely grateful to Oxbury Bank uh, and to welcome uh, Nick Evans, who's the MD uh, and founder, one of the co-founders of Oxbury, um, to who's going to be speaking this evening. Um, Oxbury are, are really the new kids on the block. We've, we've they've been kindly sponsoring these webinars for a few months now. Um, they were founded in 2021 by bankers, farmers, and technologists, and they're the only UK bank that's 100% dedicated to serving farmers, food producers in the rural economy. And I'm sure Nick will uh, take advantage this evening to give us a lot more detail about Oxbury and what they can do for us, and particularly for new entrants, which is the topic of our uh, discussion this evening. Um, we're also uh, joined by uh, Caroline Squire, who I'm sure many of you will know. Caroline is uh, one of our uh, TFA advisors, um, is a Royal Surveyor, and joined the TFA uh, coincidentally when Oxbury Bank was founded in January 2021. So there you go, there's a bit of a join up tonight. Um, uh, Caroline's a member of the uh, our MRICS and a fellow of the CAAV, and she has seven years' experience working in the rural advisory sector, and I'm sure many of you have used her advice and will continue to do so. So it's great to have uh, Caroline here this evening. Uh, she's based down in South Devon um, and has a good connection within the farming community, so I'm sure gets her hands dirty on a regular basis as well as advising us how to get our hands dirty in a more profitable way. So that's good. Um, Nick, as I say, is the uh, co-founder spent uh, and uh, co-founder and managing director of Oxbury Bank. He spent his career in the farming industry, both within the financial services and latterly in international agricultural IT. He worked for ICI. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a name from the past for us all. Um, but, but but most of us will remember them and the Bank of Scotland. And in 2000, he set up farm, First for Farming with 12 of the leading players in agriculture and the farming sector. And they became the leading specialist in IT integration solution provider for the agricultural, agriculture and animal health supply network across Europe, North America, Asia, and Southern Africa. Um, and as I say, went on then to form Oxbury Bank, uh, which became a fully regulated bank in February 2021. So it'll be really interesting to hear from Nick this evening about what they bring to the agriculture sector. And it's really good to have some new kids on the block within the finance sector, I think, within agriculture. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, as I say, as ever, it's uh, we're very pleased to have Oxbury sponsoring the event. It is being recorded. Uh, so those of you who want to go back and uh, revisit anything you hear this evening or indeed know people that might want to look at this after the event and aren't able to join us this evening, then please point them to either our website or to uh, our YouTube channel uh, where you'll be able to uh, see this uh, event again. And just to remind you that we've run these for quite a while. The most recent ones uh, we had over the last few months uh, were around the Rock Report, DEFRA's ALMS updates and which environmental scheme might be best for you, um, putting farm tenants in pole position to take advantage of natural cap capital opportunities and uh, the slurry storage uh, um, scheme. So, and go back into last year, there's many other topics that we covered as well. So please take advantage of those uh, chances to go back and relook at, at those when you have time. Um, as I say, this evening we are focusing on new entrants, um, and some of you will no, no doubt be aware that there's a um, under the new Elm scheme, there's a pilot um, project out. We would be really interested to hear from anybody that is involved in the pilot project to see how that is going. 
Um, it was interesting. We were invited and Lynette Steele, who, again, many of you will know as our chief policy advisor, um, attended a meeting this afternoon, which was hosted by Mark Spencer, uh, the DEFRA minister, uh, specifically around new entrants. So it's good to see that they're really trying to push this area. It's it's really important, I think, for the future of the sector that we, we get some new young blood and innov innovative ideas coming into the sector. But there are some challenges to do that. Uh, no doubt between them, Caroline and Nick will answer all of those challenges this evening. And so we can all go away knowing how to do it at eight o'clock. Um, just one final point. We've uh, got an opportunity for two students to win free student memberships of the TFA tonight. So all you have to do is to ask a question during the evening's webinar. And the first two students to get their questions selected and answered during the, well, I think just selected, they may not be answered, but selected certainly, uh, will receive uh, a year's free membership to the student membership to the TFA. So for those students out there, when putting your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, please, in the Q&A box, uh, if you could just preface your question with student and complete it with your email address, uh, and then George Dunn will select uh, the two best questions and you will be able to get that free membership. So uh, all those students out there, get your thinking caps on, get your questions out there. So uh, without further ado, um, we'll crack on with the with the uh, crux of the evening. Um, and I will invite Caroline, first of all, to give us her comments about what to include in a tender application and the no doubt the pitfalls and the opportunities that arise. So over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so, yes, I'm Caroline Squire and um, I will be talking you through what to include in a tender application. So <clears throat> I thought, firstly, I'd just touch on the importance of a good tender. Um, so ultimately, your tender documents which you submit are going to be the landlord's first impression of you in a lot of cases, and they're going to determine whether or not you're shortlisted and make it through to interview. So it is really important to put a comprehensive application together. And a good tender application should show numerous things, including your technical ability, financial standing, entrepreneurial flair and business mind, your professionalism, and I would say probably most importantly, the justification of a business argument, which is mutually beneficial. So you need to be able to show that you can pay a viable and competitive rent, and therefore the relation that the that benefits the landlord in the relationship. And likewise, that you can also make a living and profit from your farm business, and therefore you benefit from the relationship. Um, it is, I would say, worthwhile considering asking a professional for their input and help with a tender application, because it, it can take a lot of practice to hone your skills in putting a comprehensive application together. But one word of warning is that if you do do that, do ensure that you fully understand the plan and where all the figures have come from, because at the end of the day, it is still your plan and you very much need to own it. Um, it goes without saying that your agent obviously won't be in the interview room with you if you make it that far to help you answer the questions. So you do just need to fully understand uh, where everything in the plan has come from and, and absolutely own it. So moving on, um, your business plan and what to include. So you need to set out your proposals from the farm within your business plan. And that would include your farming system, any diversifications, um, any improvements which you would implement in order for your farming system or diversifications to work. Um, and also any management plans, be it manure management or soil management. And furthermore, if you've had experience of those management plans previously, I would mention that just to demonstrate that you are thoroughly capable of actually implementing those things and not just good at talking about it. Um, secondly, you need to include your proposed rent. Um, probably one of the most common questions I get asked is how much rent should I tender? And I always give everyone the same advice in that, yes, you need to ensure your bid is competitive, but most importantly, you need to ensure that it's viable. And realistically, the last thing any sensible landlord will want is a tenant who finds that a few years into the fixed term, they can't actually service the rent. Um, 
And equally, the last thing a tenant is going to want is um, to find out that a few years into the term, they can't service the rent and they've got an unviable failing business behind them. And I think particularly for new entrants, you do need to remember that we are entering a new financial environment. Um, this is the last year of BPS. Payments next year are going to be delinked. So new entrants aren't going to be eligible for delinked payments given that they're linked to uh, historic occupation. So if you weren't in occupation and claiming BPS during the reference period, you won't be eligible for delinked payments. So I would almost encourage people to put your blinkers on a little bit. I mean, even if there's a farm just down the road that's very similar and you know what the rent passing for that is, if that was agreed a few years ago, they're in a completely different financial situation to you. They're having these the BPS and the delinked payments, which are a significant um, slice of income. So if, if you're not going to have that, you are in completely different financial situations and you need to focus on what's viable for you rather than looking at what other people are paying. And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be tempted to bid high just to get the farm because I, I know sometimes people do do that, but um, it, it's just not worth it in the end because it's not worth the risk of um, not being able to service the rent if it's not sustainable and then having a failing business off the back of that. Um, it's also really important to do your research and find out what the landlord is looking for, find out what their objectives are. So the more you can tie your plan up with the landlord's objectives, the better your chances of success will be. So just as an example, if the landlord wants the farm farmed in a particular way, um, let's say an environmentally sensitive way, just as an example, they are more likely to go with somebody who proposes to do just that and perhaps offers a lower rent off the back of it than someone who offers a higher rent but wants to farm in a really intensive, non-environmentally friendly way. So it is really important to find out what the landlord is looking for and tie your plan up with that as much as possible. I appreciate some landlords are purely money orientated, um, but not all of them are. And equally, if when speaking to the landlord, you find out that, that if that was their, their sole objective, just to get as much rent as possible, then I think that's the point where you need to take a step back and consider whether it's worth your time and effort in applying if all the landlord is going to be looking at is the rental figure rather than the business plan and the person behind it. Um, so you also need to include your personal details and ideally a list of current assets and current liabilities if possible. Um, you should also shout about your farming experience, training, education and skills. I always suggest that it's a good idea to include your CV in an appendix of your business plan, because that's a really good way of highlighting all the education, experience and training that you've had behind you and um, showing why you're the ideal tenant for the holding. And finally, I would also include references. And I normally suggest including one farming reference, one financial reference and one character reference, because then that covers all bases. So you'll also need to include figures to substantiate your business plan. So you'll need to provide cash flow forecasts, profit and loss accounts and balance sheets. And you ought to provide them for at least the first three years of the term or the first break point if there is one. But if there isn't, go for the first three years unless the application pack states otherwise, then follow that. Um, and you, you just need to appreciate that although agriculture has been very volatile, especially over the last year or two, um, so it, it is only going to be your best guess and they might not be completely correct, but the landlord will be interested in your approach and judgment in putting your figures together and they will appreciate that it reflects your best guess and, and might not be for certain as nobody obviously has a crystal ball. So if we could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so just going through um, which each thing is. So a cash flow forecast should show how much money your business expects to receive in and pay out each month, usually over the course of a year. And then your profit and loss accounts, they project how much money your business will bring in by selling and how much profit or loss, I would caveat, um, your business will make from those sales. And then your balance sheets show your business's net worth so if you imagine a sheet of paper with a line drawn down the middle, you would have your business's assets listed down one side, and that would be things like stock, machinery, cash in the bank. And then you would have your business's liabilities listed down the other. 
So that could be things like uh, loans or debtors. And you would calculate your business's net worth by deducting your liabilities from your assets. And what you would hope to be able to show is that over the course of the fixed term, your business's net worth increases. So if you're putting balance sheets together for the first three years of the fixed term, you would hope that in year three, your business's net worth is higher than your business's net worth in year one. And borrowed funds, um, if they form part of your business plan, it's really important to include those in the figures um, in the figures above. And you must ensure that you include evidence that those borrowed funds are available. So if, for example, you're relying on an overdraft facility from your bank, uh, I would advise including a letter from your bank manager just to confirm that that, that overdraft facility is available. And um, do bear in mind as well, if you are borrowing, that it can take time to set up. So that's something uh, definitely not to leave till the last minute and to think about in good time. So it's also really important to show that you're thinking from all angles. So I would always suggest including a sensitivity analysis within your business plan to show how your business will react to changes which are outside of your control. So be that a change in yield, a change in market prices, um, coming down with TB. And what you'll hope to show is that your business is still viable, even if hard times hit. And that will give your landlord confidence in your business plan and confidence in your ability to service the rent throughout the fixed term. So that's really important. And I would also suggest including a SWOT analysis. So this is where you analyze the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of your business. And if you're able to show how you would overcome the weaknesses and threats, then all the better. So I've got some final tips. Um, the first one, although it sounds simple, um, it's surprising how many people don't do this, but do refer back to the application back, pack and ensure that you've included everything that's been asked for, ensure that you've filled out um, all the application forms. You'll often find that landlords do ask you to fill out application forms alongside your business plan. So do make sure the application forms are filled out thoroughly with all the information that's been asked for. Um, don't just write C business plan. It's always better to include exactly what has been asked for so they can read that and then read your business plan. And um, do ensure that your plan and all the documentation is easy to read and navigate through because needless to say, the landlord will probably have a number of applications to read. So the easier to read and navigate through, the better. Also, this sounds simple as well, but it's surprising how many people don't do this. Do use your tender application and business plan as an opportunity to really sell yourself and show that you have the relevant knowledge, skills, education and experience to be the perfect tenant of the holding. Um, there's no better person to shout about why you would be the perfect tenant than you and nobody else is going to do that for you. So do be big headed, do shout about um, all of the knowledge, skills, training and experience that you have and do ensure that you use it as an opportunity to really sell yourself to the landlord. And finally, my last tip is to keep persevering. Um, I think the sad truth is that it's unlikely that you'd be successful with the first opportunity that you apply for, purely because supply is massively outstripping, or demand is massively outstripping supply, sorry, um, for tenanted holdings, particularly fully equipped holdings with a house and buildings. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you've done anything wrong if you're not successful. I think a lot of the time it purely just means that there were a number of good applicants. And unfortunately, only one of those applicants could be successful. So that means a number of good applicants sadly weren't successful. Um, but if, if you do go for an opportunity and you don't get it, it's really important to ask for feedback, because if there is anything that the landlord felt you could um, improve on, then obviously you can work on that for the next time. And do just grit your teeth and keep persevering. I know it must be really disheartening if you keep going for opportunities and keep getting knocked back, but it is important to grit your teeth and keep persevering. And I'm sure the right opportunity will come along when the time is right. So I hope that was um, a useful insight. And if anyone does have any questions, do feel free to pop them in the Q&A box below. Thanks, Caroline. I think that's such a, such a lot of good advice in there, but also such a lot of stuff to get your head around as well as a 
as a, a new entrant putting a, a, a business plan together. And I'm sure your final comment there about keeping to persevere, but also to sell yourself and don't be uh, don't be modest is is really important to how you do it. Um, so as, as uh, Caroline said, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. We've got a few that have been sent in uh, prior to the evening. And if we don't get around to answering them all, we will ask Nick and Caroline to come back to you uh, and we'll put those on our on our website. So uh, keep the questions coming in. Uh, we'll move straight on to, to Nick, um, who, as I said, uh, works for Oxbury Bank. And I think, Nick, it'll be really interesting because finance is something that comes up pretty much every time new entrance is discussed is access to finance and access to land. So it'll be really interesting to see how Oxbury can uh, help in, the, in this regard. So uh, welcome and over to you, Nick. Great, thank you very much indeed, Mark. And thank you very much indeed um, uh, to George and the, uh, and the association for inviting us here today and the opportunity to sponsor the, um, to sponsor the series. So yeah, my name's Nick Evans. I'm co-founder and managing director of the bank. My background, as, as Mark just referenced, is in agriculture, agricultural banking, and agricultural IT, and then latterly, of course, setting up Oxbury. Um, I'm just going to rattle through a couple. This is really in two parts, so I'm going to rattle through in five minutes or so. Just a bit of background. Many of you may not have heard of Oxbury because we have only been lending since February 2021. Um, so just two years old, broadly, just over two years old. Um, but we are a brand new bank. Um, or new all new banks. There's only been about 30 new banks in the last 250 years. So Oxbury is one of those 30. Uh, key thing, key differences, differentiation really, we're built on new technology. And you might say, well, why is that really important? It allows us to be very flexible in how we respond to market conditions and market requirements. And the system that we've built is purely for farming. So we are an agricultural bank as uh, as Mark described, we only lend to farmers in the rural economy. That's it, um, and that's ninety percent of it. Ninety nine percent of it is is to farmers. Um, and we became a bank, by the way, for, for two principal reasons. One is agriculture is a very competitive sector. You need to have uh, both low costs and low cost of funds in order to su to succeed. And the only way you can get low cost of funds is to take funds from savers and depositors, not from wholesale lenders. So we became a bank so that we could raise deposits. And the second one is really important for tenants because in any, we're talking a minute about the, the things that we look at when we assess credit, but security is part of it. And as a tenant, typically, because you don't own the land, your ability to borrow is limited by the assets that you have and have built up on the farm, which is called floating assets. So your stock, your machinery, the things that Caroline described in her business planning there. And the agricultural charge allows us, which only can be taken by banks, allows us to take a charge over those assets and therefore secure us and therefore secure the lending. So really important point about why we wanted to become a bank was specifically focused at the tenanted sector. Next slide, please. Yeah. And just a quick one here, because obviously we are an agricultural bank. Um, that's not a new or a unique uh, thing. There are agricultural banks around the world and a couple of ones you'll be familiar with, Credit Agricole in, uh, in France and Rabobank in the Netherlands uh, being two, the Agricultural Bank of China and so on and so forth. So there are agricultural banks around the world. We just haven't got one here until now. Um, and here's, this, here's the thing. We, we believe it's really important for the UK to have an agricultural bank. Just some stats there on the bottom left. So in, the, in France and the Netherlands, UK and Germany, we're all kind of the same geographies with the same demographic, with the same kind of population, the same industry mixes broadly, uh, political situation, etc. In France and the Netherlands, where you've got agricultural banks, you can see agriculture as a percentage of GDP, so the economy of the country, 1.7 in France and 1.6 in, in the Netherlands. In the UK and Germany, where we don't have specialist banks, it's 0.7. So we want to address that and, and invest in UK agriculture, including the tenanted sector, in order to help UK agriculture become a bigger part of the UK economy, which it absolutely can do. And some things on the right-hand side there, how, how 
And again, we're very positive about, about the uh, UK agricultural sector, clearly, because that's the sector we lend into. But those are just some of the reasons why. So the ability to, be, to substitute imports, you know, we import, for example, 80% of all the pears eaten in the UK are imported. Not far off the same on apples. Uh, we're still importing products, cheeses and, 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 and dairy products when we can produce those things here. So import substitution, export opportunities, added value, productivity, efficiency improvements. There's some massive changes happening in the retail and food supply chain right now. I mean, the food supply chain is broken. There's opportunities in there for farmers. And then climate change, sustainability, biodiversity and data. I mean, a massive big bucket of stuff there. But those all have positive impacts, financial impacts for the agricultural sector. Uh, next slide, please. And if anybody understood, wanted to know why, why, what, where's the opportunity and why go into agricultural banking, here's really the, the issue. If you look at 2008, the global financial crash up to today, total borrowing 12 billion to 21 billion, and that's really funded consolidation in the sector. But here's the key thing, bank overdrafts, working capital. So the things that all of you are going to need who are applying for uh, to become farmers, you're going to need working capital. That's typically been funded by bank overdrafts. Here's a situation. In the same period, 25% of the borrowing in 2008 at 3 billion, that's now down to 2 billion, 10% of the total. So down 31%. And if you look at trade credit, the amount of money owed by farmers to distributors, so people like Wednesday Cars, Northwestern Farmers, Frontier, et cetera, that's gone up by 24% from 1.8 billion to 2.25 billion. So now farmers owe distributors more than they owe the banks on bank overdraft, uh, and really why Oxbury's come into place to provide and, and provide some uh, additional firepower into that working capital sector and long-term loans as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So this is what we do as Oxbury. There are things here that are relevant, I think, to, to all of you on the call. Just to start at the bottom, everyone will be familiar with asset finance, so funding of machinery cars, commercial vehicles, cultivation kit, tractors, blah, 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 where the security is the asset itself. So tenants are not disadvantaged in any way when it comes to asset finance. Uh, the lender takes security in the asset, and, and that's that. So very simple and straightforward. If you default, the asset goes back. Oxbury Farm loans, typically long-term loans out to 25 years, and for things like diversification, productivity, new milking parlors, cow accommodation, sheds, et cetera, uh, land purchases. Um, so those are those typically long-term, normally fully secured. Now, the agricultural charge comes in there, but, but uh, so do charges over land, which isn't relevant to the tenant sector. So agricultural charge, very relevant in long-term loans. And this piece here, revolving credit, this is where we fund things like your working capital, uh, things you need to grow, seeds, crop, crop protection, fertilizers, animal feed, diesel, uh, spares and repairs, etc. So these are revolving credit input finance accounts that every farmer will need. I'm not going to touch on this food chain finance. It's quite specialist at the moment. But I will say one. This is one way in which, in which tenanted farmers already today are doing more of this than the owner owner occupier sector. This is where I'll use an example. Aldi have contracted with Warrendale Wagyu. Some of you may have heard of them. Five hundred head of Warrendale of Wagyu a week, and Warrendale put the animals on the farms. We fund them one hundred percent. So from a tenant's perspective, ideal. You don't need to find the capital for the animals, and then when the animals leave the farm at the end of the sort of rearing, growing, or finishing phase then Warrendale pay Oxbury and pay you the balance. So, and there's similar examples on, on spuds, on eggs, on uh, some of the uh, intensive veg crops, high value intensive veg crops. That's the same thing happening there. Backed by retail contracts. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. Finally, from an Oxbury perspective, the final slide on this really, uh, oh, in terms of the ownership of the bank, 90% of the shareholders in Oxbury are from the industry, and most of them are farmers. So uh, it's a bank that's for farming and 
owned really by the farming industry. Okay, um, now the main, the main point of the, of the session tonight really was about new gen and funding new entrants. And this is something which we are passionate about. We don't think this is an optional thing. We have to do this because no one else is really doing it uh, in, our, in our view effectively. So uh, with the average age of farmers at 60, and by the way, that's not, that's, um, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, the average age of farmers at 60, um, and with that number increasing, we do need to get new entrants into the sector in order to, to bring some new blood and new ideas, new energy and enthusiasm, new ways of adopting uh, techniques and modern practices, and also to take some risks. If you're, if you're 60 plus, why would you want to take a risk and massively grow your business when you're in the latter stages of your, of your farming career? You just don't. New gens do and will. So what, 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 what is it? Uh, next slide, please, Julia. What is Oxbury New Gen? It's a funding package and it's an advice package rolled into one exclusively for a new generation of farmers, not just the next generation of farmers. So divided into two, in terms of funding, there's an application process, which I'm going to touch on in a second, and it really mirrors some of the stuff that Caroline was talking about. The application for a tenancy is very similar to the application for funding. So uh, you will see the parallel shortly. But in terms of funding, if you're a new generation or a new entrant to the sector, you're, you're unlikely to have a huge deposit or potentially even any deposit in order to fund your way into the sector. So following successful application, we will fund up to 100% over your approved cash flow plan. So one of the three things that Caroline talked about in terms of balance sheet, PL, and cash flow, cash flow right for a new entrant is critical. If you run out of cash, you haven't got a business. So cash flow is critical. We will fund 100% of your approved cash flow plan with no deposit necessarily required. The second one is advice. So if you're a new start into, the, into, into farming, then it's quite possible and actually reasonably likely that you might want a mentor or somebody to, to metaphorically hold your hand and provide you with some thoughts and guidance about um, how you're doing and what you should do. So in that respect, Oxbury, where necessary, will pay for business and financial advice and support pre-go live and for three years subsequently to make sure you, you succeed. And that really is about, it's a benefit to both of us. It's a benefit to Oxbury because we can ensure that the business plan is on track and where it's going off track, we've got someone holding the hand of the new, of the new gen to, to get it back onto track. And it's a benefit to the new, new gen farmer uh, as a sounding board, as a guide, guidance and advice, someone to ring when you've got a problem. And the consultants that we're working with are listed along the bottom there. You'll be no, those of you who are from the farming sector will recognize many of these names. They're all household names of consultants in the sector, most of them big regional or national firms. And then there's three really quite specialist ones in, in, uh, in certain geographies. So West Wales, Shropshire in the Midlands, and, uh, and Cheshire in Lancashire. Okay. And the, but, but just to say, actually, of course, this is a national scheme. So wherever you're from, this is, this is available to you. Next slide, please. So criteria for it must be a new business startup. Uh, relevant experience. So you're likely to have been on, been working on a farm or have agricultural experience. You may be a son and daughter of a farmer and not, not there's no room at home. Um, but that piece about relevant practical experience working ag or horse that is really important. So if you're a hairdresser today and you fancy a go at pig farming, you're probably not going to get through. Um, your proposed business plan, and coming back to some of the things that Caroline said, your proposed business plan must have uh, ag, horse, or food production as the core business activity. So if you think, well, I want to get a tenancy and then I'm going to cover it in caravans, that's probably not what we want to be seeing. We want to be seeing businesses that are going to start actively farming, where farming is the core activity. 
18 to 40 at a time with DEFRA's definition of, of young. And you must not be already earning an economic wage from, a current, from your own farm. So this is about focusing on new gen, uh, new gens into the sector. Uh, next slide, please. Four stage application process. Uh, and it and it's in a way mirrors some of the things that Caroline was talking about. Um, and there's a chicken and egg scenario about if you're going for a tenancy, what do you do first? Do you go for the tenancy, then subsequently look to find that, do the financing, or do you get the financing in place and do the tenancy? So, and I completely get that, and we can have a discussion about that in the Q&A later if you like. But online application, you there's six boxes which broadly summarize what it is you're looking to do, who you are and what you're looking to do, and why. Uh, and you confirm within that online application that you meet the criteria, the six criteria we put in the previous slide. Uh, to date, we've had over 100 online applications into Oxbury for new gen uh, projects. Very, very motivating. And most of them are super high quality. Once, uh, when I say applications as well, some of them will be inquiries. So. They haven't necessarily gone through the whole application and produced a whole CV and cash flow, but they've said, this is my criteria, this is my rough plan, would I be eligible? I'm gonna go for a tenancy, and the answer to that is yes. Where they have got a tenancy application in place or they've already secured a tenancy, then we fast track this lot through. So application, then there's a panel presentation and, and sort of round table discussion. Out of that, we refine the business and cash flow requirement, normally including a consultant at that point or one of our relationship managers sits down with the, with the applicant and puts together, in effect, the credit proposal. And that credit pro proposal will include the balance sheet and, and P&L, but really, really focus on cash flow. And then a final application and into credit submission and off we go. Uh, just to give you an idea, we've we've of the over a hundred, there are uh, five deals already uh, executed. Mix of mix of them. There's a dairy one. There's a two egg two egg ones. There's a specialist uh, herb one, uh, and an and an arable one. So it's a mix of enterprises uh, that we're that we're looking to fund. So that's the application process. Uh, next slide. And the loan itself um, that we do, it's broadly into two parts. And we write this as two, as two loans. There's, let's call it an equity backed part. So if you're buying livestock uh, and you're paying 1,500 pound a cow, for example, so the one we've done, the dairy one, the guy's buying 100 cows, 1,500 pound a cow, that's the equity backed part, but he also needs a working capital to feed them, vet and med, labor, and to pay himself so he's not working for absolutely nothing for the, for, for the next couple of months. Um, so there's a non equity backed part. So we do this in two loans. Uh, we fund the first loan over a period that, that matches the cash flow requirement, and the second loan over a period that matches the cash flow requirement. Most of these are uh, interest only to start with. Uh, as the business progresses over the years, then the non-equity backed part is repaid first because the rates we charge, it is a standard farmer rate. So any farmer would, would, would get a rate of you know, whatever the, num the number is today. And then the non-equity backed part, the sort of high risk part from a bank perspective, we have to charge a small premium, a small, I mean, one or 2% over base in addition to the uh, standard rate, so a small premium, and you as the farm will pay this bit back first by preference uh, before you start attacking this portion. And then from additional lending backed by business performance, we positively considered. So, so we're already seeing the businesses that we're funded now, the, the egg one was the first one we did, and when they're, they're doing so well, they're already talking about the next shed and then and, and enlarged in size of the flocks. The business is cash flow positive. It's doing really, really well. So we are actively looking to help them grow and expand. 
final slide. And just some examples of things that we're doing. So Caroline's presentation focused on applying for a tenancy. That isn't the only way in uh, from our perspective in, as a new gen. Um, some of the ones that we're seeing, in fact, quite a few of the ones that we're seeing are where people are buying into, buying into an existing partnership or sole trader, where uh, particularly livestock farmers get to 70 or over and they say, listen, I want to carry on. I want to own the land. I don't want to give the land up, but I'm, I'm now had enough of it. I'm not giving this enough uh, oomph into the business. I'm not going to retire, but I'll form a trading partnership with a new gen. Then the new gen buys into the trading assets, maybe like the cows or the livestock, the milk in parlor, whatever. Farmer retains the land and they have a and they have a business partnership going forward. Livestock purchases and so on. You can read this uh, uh, as easily as I can, can read it out. So those are the sorts of things we're doing. But this one here, uh, buying into existing partnership is a big one. Tenants capital, initial farm rental payments. That's um that's clearly what Caroline was focused on. I think the final slide. Getting going with the advisor. We think it's advice. The advice and consultancy is fundamental to us here. We've got selected experts to help and guide you through the first three years. Uh, in terms of how that works, you contract with them. It's paid by Oxbury, and it's up to half a day per quarter for monitoring and plans and discussion on strategy. Nick, wow, that was uh, that was fantastic, and I have to say. Um, well, first of all, I'm very pleased to know that I'm below the average age. So that was reassuring because there's pretty much nothing that I'm below the average age of now. So uh, that was that was quite good to hear. Um, although not so good that everybody's that the average age is so high, I guess. But uh, but seriously, well, how refreshing to uh, hear what you've just what you've just put forward there. I think it's probably and, and Caroline uh, mentioned the the perseverance thing. I, I think. One of the most difficult things for new entrants trying to get involved in agriculture is accessing finance and going to the the usual names that we all know and uh, essentially not having an asset to to back that and therefore not being able to get the business uh, you know what could be a very successful business off the ground. So uh, thank you very much for 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 putting all that forward. It's uh, it is seriously very refreshing to see to see that approach and. Uh, um, certainly from a tenant's point of view, uh, not just for new entrants, I think it's uh, it's really good to see uh, you guys uh, coming into the you know into the arena. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I just I just reiterate, we almost certainly won't get through all the questions. So apologies for that. I, I always have to do that. Uh, I'm sure Nick and Caroline will be more than happy to answer the questions we don't get around to offline and as ever julia will do her magic with the website and uh put those questions out so everybody can uh can see those for those that we we don't get to so apologies if your question doesn't get asked uh what i'm going to do though to kick the uh, uh the q a session off is to ask george dunn our chief executive who i'm sure all of you know to uh who selected the two student questions to just start off the Q&A with those questions, because there's some really good ones coming, I see. So, George, do you want to kick us off? OK, yes, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, so we have two questions. Um, and the first one, who wins a year's student membership of the TFA, is Barbara Mills. And she was on a Deaf for New Entrance incubator pilot with the uh, Harper Adams. Um, and she was asked, she's asked a very practical question. For a new tenancy, and maybe for the new gen um, ap application as well, what's the best length of application and business plan? In other words, how many pages are you expecting to see from these prospective tenants? Oh, that is a good question. I don't think there's necessarily a certain number of pages. Um, I, I couldn't just pluck a number out of the air and say that's the perfect amount. Um, because it will very much depend on the farm as to how how much detail you'll need to go into as as well as much as anything. Um, but you do just need to ensure that you've included everything which I've listed out in my presentation and all of your figures. Um, I mean, I would I would think it ought to be about 10, 10 a dozen pages long with everything included. Um, I've certainly seen a few examples of people who have just 
put two pages of A4 together and submitted that. And that's, I mean, that's that's nowhere near enough. Um, it does have to be comprehensive enough to cover everything which I've spoken about earlier this evening. And Nick, would you agree? I, I would agree. There are There are some things though that, so in speaking to landlords, there are some things that in the business plan that more and more of them want to see. And, and Caroline, you referenced this before about sustainability, about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, about you know all those things that are more regen. Uh, they do want to see that in there. So that should form part of the plan. So it's not just about the, the basics, the agronomic side of what you're going to do. It does, it should include some nod to that part of the uh, that part of the farming system. But coming back from a bank perspective, it, it's all about cash flow. And again, Caroline, you mentioned it before, to stress that and to flex it. So what if in your plan, interest rates go up to 7% as a base rate? Or what if fee prices go to 350 pound a ton, not, not 280 pound a ton? So to put some flexes in there, milk price comes down to the 32p or goes up to 60p. To give some flexes in that that are reasonable, uh, that will demonstrate not just a financial, a financial understanding, but also that it gives some reassurance both to the landlord and to the bank that you've got some grasp about financial matters. So those would be my two bits of guidance. Robust financials that are believable and you've stressed, and don't just put about the, the agronomic side. Put some pieces about sustainability and future farm resilience, basically. How resilient are you going to be going forward in, in the face of what will undoubtedly be new regulation? Thanks, Nick. Um, I, I was talking to a landlord uh, a couple of weeks ago who was involved in a tender exercise where one applicant had put in a tender of 75 pages, and the landlord was basically saying far, far too much information. Um, so, yeah, two pages too short, 75 pages too long, somewhere in the middle. Okay, and the next student question, uh, Mark, um, uh, is from Kate Hannaford. Um, and uh, she asks, with falling farm subsidies, does the average landlord see the need for diversity? I presume she means diversification within the tenant farm in order for it to be competitive and flexible in the face of change. So it's probably one for Caroline, really. Do you think, do you think landlords are keen on diversification? Yes, increasingly so, I think. Um, I mean, particularly, as Kate says, with BPS falling away, um, other income streams are becoming increasingly important. And particularly as, as the landlord's main concern is the rent being paid, um, the, the more different income streams coming in, uh, the, the stronger and more resilient the business is going to be, and therefore the more able they will be to service the rent. So I think there, there certainly is more acceptance from landlords that income isn't just purely coming from farming anymore, and a resilient business does actually need more than just one income stream. Okay, thank you, Caroline. I would also say just make sure that your tenancy agreement doesn't say for agricultural use only if you yes. if you put forward a diversification uh, idea for your plan. So yes, Mark, so Barbara Mills and Kate Hannaford both win a year student membership at the TFA, and I'll hand back to you for the rest of the Q and A. Brilliant, thanks, George, and uh, and thanks to both of you for excellent questions. Just just following up on the second one, Nick. Perhaps I could just ask you on that on the diversification side. You obviously you obviously highlighted in your presentation that uh, somebody taking some land on and filling it with caravans wouldn't wouldn't meet your criteria. How does that how does that work in terms of a diversification? Is there a sort of you know the diversification might be important to add. I don't know, 10% of the profit to the business. Are you, do you have a sort of limit to when diversification means a, 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 a proposal to you isn't really agricultural? How do, how do you, would you fund that kind of thing? So we, we, spe we specifically say majority. So if it's 51% of the income is coming from agriculture, that, that ensures our criteria is met. Uh, what I would add though, we've, we've, we haven't declined very many outright but there were there have been that was just last week an application came in where the proposal was for so to do so many things you no know, so they're going to do some farming they're going to do some glamping they're going to do some an egg round they're going to do some milk sales they're going to do some goats they had a they had a list of 
things they wanted to do, which just it just was unbelievable. You know, they needed they were needed 48 hours in a day just to just to do the farming side without all the diversification pieces they were trying. So if you're going to put diversification in there, make sure it's reasonable and actually believable in terms of is this possible? Hard, we, 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 we can see hard work is unbelievable is just a, a prerequisite, but but uh, slavery probably isn't. <laughs> yeah, that's a good good answer. Yeah, I think I would perhaps also add on that is that to be very careful with the diversification that you're putting in, that if you are very passionate and committed to agricultural production, if I can call it that, uh, diversification isn't necessarily for everybody. And uh, just putting it in there because you think the landlord wants a bit may not be the right thing to do if actually you can make a really successful business out of your uh, agricultural uh, production. Um, so just just moving on a little bit, I, I've got a couple of questions that were sent in. I'm going to just kind of pull a few of these together into, into one heading for both of you, I think. We've got a member from Norfolk who asks that I think what is probably the, at forefront of pretty much everybody applying for, for any, any land or, or whatever, which is don't all landlords just go to the applicant who offers the highest rent? And what if I can't afford to offer the highest rent as someone else who's applying for the farm? What should I do? Can I just also just add on to that a little bit, though? Because, Caroline, you mentioned about delinking. I just wonder what impact that has for new entrants against somebody that's tendering for land who is already involved in the industry and is able to access that. And then rolling on from that again as a sort of another subsequent question around how much rent should I offer? Uh, and does it just always the highest rent is how should a new entrant factor in the new elm schemes and the uh, encouragement that we're all getting now to get involved in environmental schemes how where does that sh where should that fit into a tender um and indeed this is a question of mine it might be just my pure ignorance but uh i, I believe at the moment that elm schemes are only available to existing bps applicants so as a new entrant who isn't a new, isn't a BPS applicant, how does that work for them? So there's quite a bit, maybe just to sort of juggle around in your head there, sorry. No, not at all. Um, if I tackle the first part of that question uh, first. So yes, unfortunately, there are some landlords out there who are purely money orientated. Um, and sadly, they will only look at the bid rather than the overall business plan and the people who are behind it. Um, and that's why I say that it is really important to liaise with the landlord and their agents beforehand to actually find out what the landlord's objectives are, because if that is their objective, um, I would say it is worth just taking a step back, being realistic and thinking, actually, is it worth my time and effort in applying for this if all they're going to be looking at is the rental figure and, and not the rest of my application? Um, but there, there are landlords equally who do have different objectives, like they might want to be specifically letting to a new entrant to give them their first opportunity um, or letting so that the farm is farmed in a certain way. And it, it's always worth actually looking at the particulars because you'll find some particulars specifically mentioned that the landlord reserves the right not to accept the highest bid. And that's a, a really good indication that they're not just... Um, looking at the bid but yes i mean the, the more the more you can find out about the landlord's objectives beforehand the better um and if you can tie your plan up with their objectives the better your chances will be but yeah my key advice is that you you do just need to consider what rent your business can sustain because like i say there's no point bidding high just for the sake of getting the farm if actually you can't afford to pay that rent and in a few years time you've got failing business and worst case scenario, if you get behind in rent, your landlord could pursue forfeiture and you'll be leaving the farm early with a load of costs to pay. So it's just, it's not worth that risk at all. Um, and in terms of delinking, then yes, I, I do sadly think new entrants are on the back foot with that because someone who's already established in farming, um, that they will have they will be getting these delink payments which new entrants won't be and likewise someone who's already established will already have a lot more capital stock and machinery etc behind them um and again that that might be more appealing to a landlord but it does depend on their objectives so you know equally you might have a landlord who wants to enter who wants to let to a new entrant to give them that opportunity so 
you know, there are landlords out there who who do have those kind of objectives. So it is just worth asking around and finding out what their objectives are. Um, you might have to remind me of the rest of the question marks. Sorry, it was quite a long Sorry, one. The, the, <laughs> the one sort of slightly following on from that was the Elms question and whether um, obviously previously when putting a, a tender in, if you apply for BPS, you'd factor that in. Now we're in the new environment where Elms is the sort of support mechanism. What what emphasis should tenants or prospective tenants put on, you know, interest and in getting involved in in elms and SFI and whatever, particularly given, um, you know, we, this is an evolving subject and you're looking at, you know, you, I think you suggested a three year business plan, but mm. maybe it's a five year term and you're wanting a five year plan. We don't actually know what's happening in 2023, let alone 2028 at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think these schemes are going to become increasingly important in terms of income with BPS falling away. Um, but equally, we, we there's a lot about these schemes that we don't know what options are going to become available and what the payment rates are going to be. Um, I mean, even, even the SFI standards we know at the moment and the payment rates which are out currently, uh, the plan is for them to gradually be increased as BPS and D-Link payments are phased out. So the payment rates are going to change and we don't know exactly what they are going to be in a few years time but what i would say is that you just need to be open and honest um in your application if you've got plans and ideas to to enter these schemes as and when they become available and the sort of ideas as to what you would like to do with the farm how you would like to manage it and and what sort of options could tie up with that then certainly put that in there and be honest about it but also be honest that you don't know exactly what the options are going to be or what the payments are going to be. So I would be minded to leave leave that out of your figures because there's there's little point in just guessing and putting random numbers in just for the sake of it. If they're, you know, they could be wildly out, nobody knows. Um, so I would just make it clear that you've left like those payments out of your cash flow forecast and profit and loss accounts, all of your figures because of the unknowns. Um, but be honest that you would like to be involved in those schemes and, um, what what sort of management you would like to be doing on the farm, which could potentially fit with that? Nick, I wonder, do you what 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 um, what kind of emphasis or or knowledge do you put into you know the new support schemes? When you know if you're looking at a business plan, whether it be for a a new entrant or an existing business, how how is the bank viewing what that level of income may be, and whether indeed somebody should be applying for it? Yeah, so um, uh, it's always in the. It's it's typically it's typically um, uh, in the plans that we've seen so far. The support coming in from uh, external subsidies hasn't formed a material part of the financial plan, uh, and I think that's probably the best way. Okay, interesting. Okay, yeah, I think that's probably good advice. Good advice. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious of time, but I'm going to just try and squeeze a couple more questions in. Um, there's there's a couple around how should you approach a farm viewing day? Uh, Karen, I think it's again a bit probably for you. And also, maybe this is for both of you, I think. Do you have any tips for interview? I was, I was interested, Nick, with your approach to getting funding and very much having that kind of panel and interview and presentation. Um, mm. So I wonder, Caroline, first, if you could just have you got any tips for what how people should approach a viewing day and and then on top of that any tips for an interview and then perhaps nick you could you could perhaps look at that from a bank point of view as well as to what you want to see yeah certainly um so for the viewing day you ought to take the particulars with you along with a plan of the the buildings and the fields T take notes as you go around and take lots of photographs so that you have plenty to refer back to because it's an awful lot to take in in a very short space of time so it's useful to have something to refer back to uh, when you do get home and as you're walking around I would think about things like what are the farm's physical limitations, what farming system would work, what repairs or improvements would be necessary in order for your proposed system to work and what's the cost of those, um, are, there, are there any agri-environment schemes that you'll be expected to take over what are the implications of the farm management with those? Um, how much is the ingoing payment and what will you be expected to take over? And also very importantly, do look over the draft FBT agreement, which should be available to view at the viewing day or on request. 
um, and just check that the terms will actually work with what you plan to do on the ground. Um, and it goes without saying, just make sure you look smart and you're polite, introduce yourself, make a good first impression, ask lots of questions to establish the goals and the objectives of the letting. And also if the outgoing tenant is present, that's the perfect opportunity to ask lots of, lots of questions because no one will know the farm better than they do. Um, so if we move on to interview tips, um, again, make a good first impression, dress smartly for the occasion and make it clear that you're serious about the opportunity. Um, it's very, very important to know to to know your business plan and your figures absolutely inside out and be able to explain them, justify them to the landlord. Um, it, it's really important that your figures are credible because um, the landlord is bound to scrutinise them and question you on them. And I'd also pay attention to anything the landlord has particularly flagged up in the particulars. For example, if they've um, made it clear they have ambitions to reach net zero across the estate by a certain date, um, do some research on net zero to be able to talk confidently about it and be able to explain how your proposed farming system fits with those targets. Um, and I'd also say it's a good idea to practice talking through summarizing the different parts of your business plan uh, in readiness for doing the same interview when you're talking directly to the landlord and their agents. Yeah. And, it's, and it's very similar to us, Caroline. So, you know, familiarity, the way, the way that we do it is a, it's a round table. It's not an inter it's not like Dragon's Den. It's a very much a discussion. It's round a table, a virtual table. Um, but familiarity with the plan and with the numbers, first and foremost, just so it's for assessment of realism or not. The other thing that needs to come across is your experience. What experience have you had to date in doing what you're proposing to do? Um, it should be realistic realism, but the thing that ultimately wins for most is, is enthusiasm and passion for what you're about to do. So that, there's no deposit, there's no, there's no historic accounts to rely on. What we're really assessing is, do we believe that you are a future farmer who's going to be, be one, of the, one of the top 100 farmers in the country within the next 30 years? That's what we're saying. Do you, do you come across as that? And we've had some interviews where the people have come, they only they sit there in a suit and tie. I mean, it's fine. It's just a, just, you don't need to be you know, smart as such. Agro normal working clothes. But we had one guy turn up who was almost horizontal and who's wearing a yellow vest uh, and leaning on his partner. It just created entirely the wrong kind of impression. Uh, and, and, he, and he knew every specialist subject was absolutely everything. So it really didn't go down overly well. Not, you know, and we're, as a bank, of course, we're only looking at farm accounts. We understand the farming uh, economics. So if someone's talking to us about it, we can assess pretty instantly whether the numbers that they're presenting and the scenarios they're presenting are realistic in the context of farming economics today. So... Realism, familiarity, history of experience, and enthusiasm and passion. Dress smart, not in a string vest. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's really good advice. I think I think it's that passion, isn't it? It's that it's that belief that somebody's going to really put their yeah. heart and soul into making something work. No. Yeah. So uh, as as always, uh, I'm afraid I've run over time. Um, so. We, there were a load of questions set, sent in previously and, and quite a number that we've had this evening. So apologies if we didn't get around to them. As I say, we will ask Nick and Caroline uh, to answer those. Uh, one of the things I, I certainly take away uh, from this evening, and it was really good to hear, is to a degree, is that is that role of advice that uh, Nick highlighted in, the, uh, in his presentation um, maybe Nick, you ought to spend a bit of time with Defra explaining that advice is an ongoing thing and not just how to fill the form in, um, because that's something that uh, I know is pretty close to George's heart and Lynette's and mine, and we don't seem to be getting much traction with that. So, but it is so important, and I, and I think your your sort of offer uh, to new entrants of that three years of ongoing advice is uh, is worth its weight in gold because. You know, farming can be a, a lonely owned business and you can um, you can sort of potter around on your farm and, and think you're doing the right thing. But actually having someone coming in and saying, have you thought about this, that or the other? 
um, is is really really useful and important. So I think it's really good to see that you're including that in your in your offer. Um, so anyway, so first of all, uh, just a big thank you to to Nick from Oxbury and obviously to Oxbury for sponsoring the uh, the webinars. A big thank you to Caroline uh, for the contributions this evening. Really uh, really useful stuff in there, I think as well. Uh, just a quick reminder that our next webinar is on the 24th of May. Uh, I ought to know. I think there must be a Wednesday as well. Um, and this is about taking forward the recommenders of the Rock Review. As some of you will know, we had uh, Baroness Kate Rock uh, present to us uh, last month or a couple of months ago about the Rock Review. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, but we will be joined uh, on the 24th of May by DEFRA Minister Mark Spencer, uh, to talk about the government's, hopefully the government's response to to the review and what they're going to take forward. So that promises to be a, a pretty interesting uh, evening, I think. Um, so uh, once again, a big thank you to Nick, a big thank you to Caroline. Thank you for all of you for attending. I hope you've uh, uh, learned something. I certainly have. Um, and uh, uh, please go and enjoy the rest of your evening.